is recovery just another health trend right now, or is it really as important as everybody's making it out to be? Recovery is the difference between uh, progressing and not progressing. What we're seeing right now is this uh, kind of addition of gut brain kind of plus organ. Take these painkillers, and what that does is essentially removes the, the batteries from the, the fire alarm while the fire in the kitchen is still burning. Hi guys, my name is Forrest Smith. I am CEO and co-founder at Kenyon Labs. Welcome to Everforward Radio. Forrest, man, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Super excited. I'm so excited to dive into a concept that I think is very important, but I don't know if it's as top of mind for a lot of people as it should be, or for those that it is, are they doing the right things? Because there's a lot of information, a lot of misinformation. And so I'd love to just start off with the recovery. What is it? Is recovery just another health trend right now? Or is it really as important as everybody's making it out to be? For me, recovery is the difference between uh, progressing and not progressing. Uh, and I, I think one of the things that you can kind of base this around is, uh, you know, if you look at performance enhancing drugs, as an example, one of the things they, they really do is help you recover faster. Uh, and, you know, we're, we've been in the, uh, the photobiomodulation or light therapy space uh, for some time now, and we're starting to see from a medical standpoint, from a research standpoint, people are starting to look at, is this a performance enhancing device? Really? Uh, yes. Really? It's, it's going, kind of going that far. That's right. It's that good. All right. Well, you know, one of the reasons why, though, is that um, there's there's a couple of things that you trigger when you exercise. Mm. Uh, there's, there's adaptations that you trigger uh, for strength increase, uh, for power increase, for hypertrophy. Um, but there's also some negative impacts. And so some of the things that hold you back from being able to push yourself further from a training standpoint are uh, muscle inflammatory markers. Um, and we, we track a couple of these that we impact directly. Mm. Uh, C-reactive proteins, uh, creatinine kinase. CRP, yeah. And, and we reduced both of those by high double-digit percentages, uh, wow. so 60 to 80 uh, percent on average. And that's, that's meaningful. Um, yeah. And you know, some of the questions we get around this are, if you're reducing this muscle inflammation, are you reducing the adaptations that I'm trying to trigger as well? That's an important question. One of the, it's, it's, it's kind of logical. The, yeah, it's logical. logical is the question for it. But actually, these, these muscle inflammatory markers are not impacting your hypertrophy. They're not impacting your power generation. Mm -hmm. They're just essentially slowing you down. And it, in, in some cases, they can actually create larger systemic issues, uh, endothelial tissues impacted. Um, mm -hmm. You reduce the amount of shear stress you can... Uh, your your body the, the flexibility of your endo cardiovascular endothelial tissue mm -hmm. is is a uh, is a really good health marker for which I want to get into that in a little bit. I actually found some really amazing uh, data and talking points around endothelial cells as well as uh, angiogenesis mm -hmm. that I was really kind of eye opening for me. I love it. I, I think it's a uh, you know it's one of the the kind of s a lot of times when you're looking at things like pharmaceuticals, uh, you look at the the side impacts, uh, the mm -hmm. the byproducts of these these chemicals in your system, and they're not extremely well thought through, and you see a lot of negative uh, byproducts of these. Like where, what, what, what example would be of that? Uh, so with pain, uh, we, we deal with kind of uh, inflammation-related pain for mm -hmm. a lot of our consumers, for a lot of our users, and uh, with things like NSAIDs, you see uh, cardiovascular mm -hmm. uh, tissue stiffening. Mm -hmm. uh, you see an increase across the board, whether you're six or 60, of 30 to 50%, uh, increase risk of cardiovascular disease if you're taking NSAIDs like ibuprofen wow, yeah. chronically, which is is high, and I, I don't think it's commonly known. I, I think this is this is something where that's my surprising gave, for me, even yeah. you know, on the age discrepancy. You know, you would think as we age and maybe you know, cardiovascular system wears down, uh, vessels wear down, or they're not as resilient. I can maybe get more behind that, but to hear that something even as young as six years old, when we should be you know more developmental, more resilient, have better cardiovascular health. Uh, that's very just kind of like, I'm, I'm taken aback by that. So it is it is an increase on your underlying risk. So if you have a kind of, if you imagine at, at six years old, you're 0.0001% because you are in a healthier point of life and you're you typically have less, uh, you know, higher shear strength, less stiffening of the, the cardiovascular mm -hmm. tissue. Um, but if you increase that 0.01% roughly, as in that, that's kind of more of a, a kind of a placeholder sure. of an example, by 30 to 50 percent, it's not as impactful. You're not. You're still going to see not huge outcome mm -hmm. changes because of that. But if you're 60 years old and your baseline risk is higher, 
increasing it by 30 to 50 percent by taking and i think that the key for this is the education piece mm -hmm. when you think about doctors and the respect they command and when they prescribe you something that this is a gold standard gift that they've given you this right, is this is right. something that you're you're listening to the authorities and yeah. saying i'm i'm using best practices why would why would i not take my ibuprofen mm -hmm. uh, every day and um what's just generally not known about this is that uh, liver damage risks, um, stomach endothelial tissue, ulcers, yeah. ulcers yeah, yeah. cardiovascular endothelial tissue, um, and, and then some of the brain impacts uh, mm. that, that come from this as well are just not very well known. The, the reducing of uh, neuroplasticity uh, over time from chronic use of so affecting brain health now. That's right. Wow. That's wow. right. And so what we see is this this kind of um, existing paradigm of okay, it's reasonably inexpensive to do this. Mm from a, a cash out of pocket standpoint, but what do you, what is it costing you long-term relative mm -hmm. to your health? And so you're, you're almost doing the, the, uh, the opposite of preventative health by taking these NSAIDs over time. And you, and again, these are, these are what people are coached into by their physicians because it's what phys physicians have been mm -hmm. coached into, uh, by their schooling. And I, I think this is, it starts from an educational problem, yeah. but it's, it's also one of those things that's just inertia. The, the, uh, the alternatives to this have not been, fantastic until now but now we have a really good one where we not only are we offering a inflammation reduction mm -hmm. we're offering a pain reduction that's higher mm -hmm. that's, that's clinically tested and, and repeatedly confirmed as more effective than these drugs um and and you know our goal as a company is to increase the quality of life for the largest number of people we can in the most substantial and measurable way we can and we, we've picked a very interesting segment with our first product mm -hmm. of uh neuromuscular pain and inflammation because Pain's really hard to measure. Uh, it's not one of those things where uh, you you have. There are a couple of ways of of objective measurement for chronic pain uh, that require a laboratory. Mm -hmm. But in general, the the idea of measuring pain is things like the visual assessment score, mm -hmm. which is essentially a zero to ten. The smiley scale. faces, right? Yes. Yeah. How do you yeah, yeah. how do you feel yeah. today? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is kind of almost the definition yeah. of subjective. Um, because that but, will potentially even change over time. Uh, maybe something right here right now is an eight. But unfortunately, it goes untreated or it's unsuccessful in treatment. And then over time, you just get used to it. And now it's the same pain, but your ability to relate to it lowers because it just becomes your norm. It doesn't actually change the pain level. It's just your association to it and vice versa. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And, and there's also kind of the, the neurological piece of it. And there's mm -hmm. also a biochemical piece of it. And again, what, what are we measuring? We're kind of measuring a number of different things that come back to, to kind of one uh, watershed metric mm -hmm. and nobody's really developed this metric yet and I, I think one of the interesting things that's been uh, happening over the past few years we we have a um a friendly company uh called wavi uh that that does electrical measurements of the brain and they they use external stimuli mm -hmm. um audio and visual external stimuli to measure the changes that pain makes in communication speeds that are under that are kind of under your conscious levels of wow, communication wow. between regions of your brain and so people are trying to get their arms around how do you how do you quantify mm -hmm. pain and i think we're, we're working something in the, a similar direction with our next product from a a, a measurement standpoint for the brain uh, from an optical mm -hmm. uh, measurements and i think as we move forward we'll see these this a more robust picture yeah. uh, come to light from combining this electrical optical and ideally chemical, but I, I think the chemical will come by way of the optical. Yeah, absolutely. And so before we kind of get into a lot more of the tech, which you guys are watching the video, you got to check out, we'll kind of get into more examples here. I brought some show and sell with, uh, with my um, Kineon device. Let's wrap up this kind of concept of, of recovery. Yeah. Um, so now that the listeners were aware of recovery, maybe we're taking, you know, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, like you said, or just now hopefully that word is more top of mind for the listener. Before we get into unique applications to work on recovery, what are just some general modalities that you maybe because I mean, you're a high performer, you're running a company, you're a very athletic guy. What are some modalities that you have found success in that you think in general, most people would have success success with uh, by just implementing in a regular basis for recovery? So I, I, for me, I, I kind of try to approach most things from an 80 20 type uh, mm -hmm. Pareto principle um, perspective and, and focus your energy on where you're going to get the highest return. And for me, the highest return is sleep. 
Um, so if your your sleep is good, you're, you're crucial, recovering. Crucial. Uh, muscle inflammatory mm -hmm. markers, general general inflammation in your system. Uh, you know, muscle growth. Uh, you know, power indicators, strength indicators. Everything. That's that's one watershed where you if if you're hammering your sleep well. If you can get your head around that, then the, the results and the returns from that are as high as anything that you can put your time into. Now, when you say sleep, are you, can you break it down for us even a little bit more? Are you saying quantity, like we, we need more sleep and we need better sleep, or is it kind of like a dynamic duo? Dynamic duo, a, a kind of regular as much as you can. Okay. Uh, so uh, keeping your, your sleep times as regular as you can. One of the things that we've also noticed with photobiomodulation uh, that's been very well kind of documented from a medical uh, literature standpoint is that when you sleep, your brain uh, clears out a lot of waste material. Um, the glymphatic system. That's exactly. Yeah, these glial it. cells. It's like the the the. It's like sending your brain through a washing machine or yes. a, a car wash. You know, it'll actually condense down in size. It'll get to work, scrub everything, and then flood it out through the uh, glymphatic and lymphatic system. That's exactly it. Yeah. And and however, if you're not getting enough sleep, or if the sleep is not regular enough, um, or or not deep enough, uh, there's a number of different kind of markers for this. Uh, and again, we're still kind of, this is one of the most exciting, it's just a small, a small ADD branch off here. <laughs> this is one of the reasons that it's so exciting to be in the, the, the tech hardware space mm. relative to this right now is that we're starting to see things like, we're starting to see things like uh, yeah. Innox, uh, the, the guys who are doing um, great uh, nitric oxide and, and um, muscle oxygenation uh, sensing. We're starting to be able to see more of this data coming back out of our body and interpret it in a more meaningful way because of the advances mm -hmm. from both a hardware and a machine learning standpoint. And for us, we're finding that same thing is like when you pull more data out, you yeah. can find both intuitive uh, ways, paths through that, um, but also kind of a, a more data-driven way to kind of improve these high leverage points. Mm -hmm. But back to sleep, um, when you're not getting enough sleep, those that uh, glymphatic system, mm -hmm. those glial cells are, are just not as effective. And so one of the things we found with photobiomodulation is it has a protective effect and that you can increase mm. the, the glymphatic function of your brain when you aren't getting enough sleep. Really? And so treating prefrontal cortex in particular and then treating your, your sinus areas uh, around your face um, has been shown in, in a number of different studies, shown and then wow. kind of confirmed in a number of different studies. Like using during sleep or before sleep or After, just in general? Yeah, so if okay. I, if I uh, so when I'm traveling, for example, I, I haven't... Um, I don't have the the uh, the fully adapted uh, version of, of uh, how to get my, my sleep uh, exactly right. <laughs> I was sharing with him earlier about uh, my my hack for jet lag using a uh, fly kit. Yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm signing up for that immediately yeah, because yeah. it is again this, this is one of those high leverage points. It's it's uh, you know two pieces of that. You have a high leverage point of sleep relative mm -hmm. to what's happening in your body from a recovery standpoint. Mm -hmm. Within that, you have a high leverage point of what sleep's doing for your brain. And so again, that's that's where we kind of focus on with the the photobiomodulation is this transcranial piece for treating that prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. and then the sinus areas and you see the waste uh, materials processing. So if I, if I, for example, don't sleep very well tonight in the morning tomorrow to increase the, the processing of that waste and not leave it there mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. for extended periods of time, uh, you can use a photobiomodulation uh, prefrontal cortex and, and on your sinus areas. This is, um, I'm just having like a, my brain's lighting up right now because uh, this is one of the things I love most about understanding how we work physiologically, biochemically, we often think the thing is the thing like, oh, I'm not performing well, I'm not training well, I'm not recovering well, because I didn't get enough sleep. Well, that's just like the surface level thing. What's really happening is, yeah, you didn't get enough or you didn't get enough quality sleep. But because of that, your body, your brain really is not then able to get rid of what it needs to get rid of. And you're literally then waking up, training again, traveling again, living again, sitting with this metabolic waste, extracellular waste, in some way, toxins, yes. which is going to then just, I mean, it's literally a one-way valve, the yes. lymphatic system. So it's a, a, from top down system, you're then, the rest of your body then is just stuck with kind of dealing with this on top of the demands of everyday living, on top of the demands of your training schedule. And so the thing is never the thing I've come yeah. to realize. That's right. It's, it's a sum of a lot of different parts. Yeah. And I think there are, and again, this comes just comes back to how exciting it is to be in this space right now, where you can start kind of, you know, looking at this meat machine we're we're driving around, <laughs> truly, and, and truly, like yeah. taking apart the taking yeah. apart the engine a little bit, as it were. There's, um, I have in my notes here. I'll share in the show notes for everybody. Actually, while we're on the topic of photobiomodulation, red light therapy, and uh, sleep, there was this amazing study I found around. I think it was in the uh, the Rio Olympics years ago. Um, yeah, uh, the impact of wavelengths of LED light therapy on endothelial cells. Um, I'll, like I said, link it in the show notes. But basically, this is now 
you're an Olympic athlete. The 1% difference matters to you. It might not matter for us here, but you know, maybe for somebody listening, but even still just being aware of, okay, I'm in a different environment. I'm in a different time zone. I'm in a different, uh, you know, elevation, like we were talking about earlier. Uh, I'm out of sync in some little way, even though the rest of my training, the rest of my life, the rest of my healthy habits are more or less kind of locked in. What they were finding was that the time then that they were getting to perform, like they were getting slotted for their competition was not what they trained in or they're in a different time zone. And it's like the middle of the night and their body's supposed to be asleep. By just using this photobiomodulation, the red light therapy, basically it, it was kind of like it was jump starting circadian rhythms or resetting it in a little bit. So, I mean, just the hacks that are possible with this to reset something that's going to help your recovery, help your training. But let's be honest, if we can on time as often as possible, maintain that circadian rhythm, that sleep and rise schedule, even when we're halfway across the world or having to perform in odd hours, that I think is the ultimate hack. 100%. Because that's going to ripple into everything that you do, how you think, yes. cognition, performance, mood. Um, I mean, everything. No, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, kind of add on that a little bit, there's, there's um, with uh, sleep and with kind of your circadian rhythm, there's a lot you can do to manipulate it. And it's a whole subject of its own. Um, but one thing that we have noticed is that it it's impacting by way of your vagus nerve is, is the main mediator for this mm -hmm. uh, different parts of your body by way of your organs. And so one of the things we've seen in the literature recently, and, and has been very interesting for us from a photobiomodulation therapeutic standpoint, is the connection between we, we've kind of known about the, the gut brain connection mm -hmm. for some time. What we're seeing right now is this uh, kind of addition of gut brain kind of plus organ. And so um, oh, wow. with uh, liver, as an example, you, you see your gut brain liver connection mm. uh, as an axis right now for uh, turning on and turning off. That makes total sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I've never thought about this, but yeah, <laughs> literally everything's connected to that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so the enzymes that you're getting into your gut uh, kind of, the, the, one of the things that we've seen with this is the ability to impact um, what's known as, and we'll be launching a product for the gut next mm -hmm. year that's dialed in specifically for dosing to reduce inflammation in the gut. But you can also improve things just by kind of, uh, oftentimes when you have inflammation in your gut, you have kind of joints of mm -hmm. those in the kind of gut endothelial tissue that don't kind of butt up mm -hmm. as, as tightly as uh, you'd like to see them. And uh, when they don't, you increase uh, inflammation in the area. Your digestive profile isn't as good from from what you see. Mm. But there's there's some things that are happening. This is another thing that just comes back to like what a, what an amazing time to be alive. Um, but the omics, uh, and in this case, uh, general, generally kind of the metabolomics for the gut is the mm. the biggest thing. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, so there's there's a bunch of different new measurement methodologies, um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, they still kind of are for for gut. Most of these require the poop studies, uh, which is not the not mm -hmm. the most fun study to go do. <laughs> but the uh, what you get back out of this now though right. is, is uh, you can classify. It's um, a masterclass of exactly what's going on in your gut. Yes, and therefore, in a way, your immune system as well. Yes, that's exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, all that to say, uh, we've we've kind of identified um, three, well, four now uh, different wavelengths of uh, infrared light that are a little bit longer than what's been. Uh, and this this all kind of goes back to our model that we've built around dosing with uh, with light is very similar to kind of dosing with pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. uh, insofar that you're you're essentially trying you you can't change something that you don't change chemically you can't impact something that you mm -hmm. don't change chemically and what you do with light is you impact uh, a number of photo acceptors uh, at different depths of tissue and the different wavelengths allow you to penetrate to those different depths and interact with these different molecules. Um, but it kind of goes back to our general 80-20 look at things. Uh, when you're impacting signaling molecules, what's coming downstream from those can really be uh, powerful impacts. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from an immune system, um, we are building out some studies for this next year on using these different, these four different wavelengths of infrared to be able to modulate immune, uh, immune system responses uh, and then test them relative to this. But what's been crazy about that is the gut is is the best place to to really kind of interact with oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah. When you add the gut plus brain, it's synergistic. It's additive. Mm -hmm. So it's and so you get these logarithmically better outcomes wow, wow. for people relative to their their immune responses, and it's it's really powerful. And I think, you know, we're looking at, at things where um, there have been studies for. Uh, 
substantial, substantially positive outcomes on asthma um, from from not from treating your lungs, but from treating your gut and and brain. No way. And, uh, wow. There, there's a number of different studies in this space right now, um, and it is, it's generally termed remote photobiomodulation. So mm -hmm. photobiomodulation, light therapy, uh, remote photo, photobiomodulation. How do we treat tissue and impact non-local tissue? And mm -hmm. it's um, we're, we're seeing some really interesting results from this, and it's, it's kind of giving us a better idea as to what's mediating these effects. That's fascinating. I, I just want to go back a little bit and kind of define our terms. Um, okay. We've mentioned endothelial a mm -hmm. couple of times, and just to kind of paint the picture for the listener maybe is unaware of this, I'm just pulling from an online Google definition here. The endothelial cells form a single cell layer that lines all blood vessels and regulates exchanges between the bloodstream and the surrounding tissues. Signals from the endothelial cells organize the growth and development of connective tissue cells that form the surrounding layers of the blood vessel wall. So basically everywhere. Yes. yes. <laughs> this, this is why this is so important. Yes. And it's also just to kind of uh, add on that as well. Um, there's been... I would say recently, but over the last 10 years, a lot more research into the fact that our uh, cardiopulmonary system is not mm -hmm. a, a kind of two gas system. It's, mm -hmm. it's been kind of mm -hmm. traditionally thought of as carbon dioxide and, and oxygen. Mm -hmm. And what's coming to light is that there's a, a huge role for nitric oxide uh, in this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is something I had down. I really wanted to get into because it's fascinating. Um, I want to put this in the notes as well for everybody. Go back in, I think last year I had Dr. Lou Ignaro on the show. He won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of nitric oxide. An older gentleman, great guy, amazing conversation, just understanding the necessary role that NO plays in the body and how and why it's produced, but also how we can stimulate more. The downstream effects are amazing. It seems that this red light therapy photobiomodulation has an effect on NO production and it seems to release more of it. That's what I was kind of finding in the literature. Can you shine right. a light on that, please? Yeah, Pun intended. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, that's exactly what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, so what, why is that important? And you know, you know, what are the benefits you, we, we can see from more NO? So just, just to kind of uh, provide a little bit more context for it, you're, you have different types of, um, you have different, there's many different functions for nitric oxide in the body. And because of that, you have different ways to generate it. Mm -hmm. um, these, the methods for generating are gen generally called nitric oxide synthases. Um, and so you have an endothelial nitric oxide synthase, for example, which is one of the more powerful ones because mm -hmm. it actually generates a lot more before it but than the, the other ones before it has to kind mm -hmm. of be essentially recharged. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But um, it's finicky. NO has a very quick half life in the body. Yes. So yeah, that's why it's important to stimulate the right amounts and the right frequencies. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and one of the other ones that we're, we're seeing now, though, is um, uh, mitochondrial uh, uh, nitric oxide mm -hmm. synthase. So you have you have, and this is one of the ones that we interact with. And there's there's they're still kind of fleshing this out. You know, it's it's a difficult biochemistry to pull together. But there's been mm -hmm. some assumptions made and tested around this over the recent years that kind of have let us know that um, essentially in embedded in. So there's again, so you got a few different versions of of um, synthases. The endothelium is very powerful, uh, creates a lot of, uh, of, or releases a lot of nitric oxide into the bloodstream. And uh, that nitric oxide acts as a um, dilation factor for, mm. your, for your blood vessels. Um, and why is that important? Uh, so you can deliver more blood, essentially. It's, it's uh, pretty damn know, important. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's a good thing, people. That's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it also is, is uh, um, you know, one of those things that drops off over time. So mm -hmm. as you age, mm -hmm. Uh, you create less of this, and so generating more is is really important. Mm -hmm. One of the things we also see, and this is this is a yeah, this will be a multi branch kind of nitric yeah. oxide discussion, but because it, it's it's really kind of a deep and powerful subject relative to the overall phys physiology discussion. But um, uh, one of the things that you see also from an injury uh, mm -hmm. standpoint, and we you know, this being in this space and spending so much time in the medical literature has really kind of given us a good perspective to how powerfully bad inflammation is for your body um please say one, that again please go back and say that again yeah. really like and and not it doesn't stay local mm -hmm. it, it uh it goes regional and uh mm -hmm. kind of systemic and and the the impacts of this are all negative really just not good and and chronic inflammation mm -hmm. is just a scourge it's it really um it stays around for decades mm -hmm. uh if you don't treat it mm -hmm. properly and um, it can it can really generate uh, kind of bad outcomes from a cardiovascular standpoint, from a muscle performance standpoint, from a growth standpoint, brain. Yeah, I mean, yeah. really across the board, there's nothing that it impacts positively. This chronic inflammation. I'm making a prediction now that I, I feel like in 2024, 
inflammation is going to be the new trending thing. Uh, Cause I feel like just the progression we've had in wellness uh, over the last several years is, you know, we've gone from a lot of different hacks, you know, cold plunge and recovery, like we've been talking about. And, you know, even focusing on, I feel like gut health has finally kind of gotten like the niche focus and attention it deserves beyond just, Oh, let me eat more fiber and probiotics. You know, there's a lot more going on. Like we've been talking about with the vagal nerve and connection to every organ in your brain, but inflammation, I think is going to be the most crucial point we're looking at next for all the things you just said, daily living, chronic pain management, but those inflammatory markers, like they get worse over time and they affect everything, especially when we look at all cause mortality. Yes. And I, I think one of the things is this most. Uh, so that's that's super exciting. A that you have this inflammation, this trend towards inflammation mm-hmm. uh, education, because right now it's not there. And you you see these things where you know what what people really understand from their their inflammation is the pain. Mm-hmm. And by the time it's at a painful point, but it's more than just pain. That's exactly inflammation right. is more than just pain. Yes. Go back to what you brought up earlier. You know, CRP, C-reactive protein, yes. like the predominant inflammatory marker for the body that will wreak havoc on your health yes. and longevity if you don't get it checked out. Yes. And I, I uh, we we've seen some interesting things in some of the studies we've done that I think is a good good indicator or kind of educational piece for this. Um, we we've done some studies and there's there's larger ones we've done some internally to kind of validate mm-hmm. these. Uh, the ones we we took this from uh, was a 3,500 uh, person study, an observational study on NFL players uh, who had those who had torn an ACL and had surgery on it and those who hadn't. I'm sure you had no problem finding people to fill that. Yeah, <laughs> quite a few, quite a few. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. I've it's, had some on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a bad one though, because you, it's, yeah. it's invidious. What, what you find is that you have, you have this traumatic tissue damage. You have the surgery, which gives you mm. more traumatic tissue damage. And you think, all right, I'm going to go through rehab and then fix this. And, and probably take some level of pharmaceuticals in the meantime mm-hmm. to reduce the pain and inflammation that I have, because that's, that's the gold standard for this. What you find is 10 years later, um, you know, and, and again, we've kind of gone in and validated this with infrared cameras, the, the leg, so regional um, blood delivery is impaired. And so you see this quad will oh, be one wow. to two degrees, which doesn't seem like a lot, but is massive from a blood delivery standpoint, uh, is one to two, two degrees colder than the healthier leg. Wow. Uh, and so not only that, uh, you see a 50% increase in severe cardiovascular disease. Um, and so it's, it's what, what we've been able to f- kind of track down from a biochemistry standpoint is that that inflammation never really goes away. And like you mm-hmm. said, it, it only mm-hmm. gets worse. Mm-hmm. And so what, what they see that And then as, you get the unwanted downstream effects. Yes. Compensation, other blood vessel yes. issues, cardiovascular, cardiopulmonary issues. It's literally just a matter of time. And, but I, and I think this is, this is the part where the education comes in mm-hmm. from, from kind of an intervention standpoint. The intervention that's kind of standard for this right now is take your ibuprofen, take these, take these painkillers. Mm-hmm. And what that does is essentially removes the, the batteries from the, the fire alarm while the fire in the kitchen is still burning. And so you see these guys, and that's not only is that that damaging your cardiovascular system, but your your actual cartilage, your soft mm. tissue in your joints, and not just that local mm. joint. Everything is degrading at, a, at kind of like a 10x, 10x mm. right here, and roughly two extra other joints. But your your soft tissue is degrading mm. system wide at a faster rate because you're not paying attention to the fire in the kitchen. I want to highlight. I'm going to try to try to. Uh, He's definitely a much smarter man than I, but try to connect some other dots to a bigger picture here when we're talking about longevity, um, like the issue here and now that we need to focus on, but how it actually, how it has negative implications for the rest of your health, the rest of your life. Are you, Peter Atia. Yes, uh, yes. Outlive. Love his work, yeah. Um, his work around kind of looking at the studies of longevity, one of the, the primary indicators for are you going to suffer in older age or have a harder time or even make it to older age beyond a bunch of other things like CRP inflammation mm-hmm. um, was leg strength yeah. looking at particularly femur density bone density mm-hmm. that when that degrades you are way more susceptible to injury and what happens when we're old and we fall because we have poor leg strength poor quad strength low femur density we bust a hip yep. once that happens I think it's like 60 70 percent higher likely of yes. just death for any reason yes. also, in a matter of yeah. what 18 months or something yes. crazy it's so let's go all the way there to that end of life scenario yes. and go back to treating it here. This is what we're talking about. This is that's, where it starts. That's exactly it. And we, we do have a number of older users for our, our products. And what we found with them is that uh, it's a spiral. If, mm-hmm. if, you, mm-hmm. if you have pain in your joints, then you move less. If you mm-hmm. move less, then your joints get worse. If your joints get worse, you take more uh, mm-hmm. NSAIDs. 
your cardiovascular system gets impacted, your joints are impacted. You just, and, and it's one of the reasons why we called the company Kenyon. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenyo is Greek for movement. And you know, the, oh, the key that. for this is yeah. get, let's get these people yeah. back into movement. You can, you can literally give them years on their lives mm -hmm. and functional, more active years than they had beforehand on their lives. And again, that's that not to, I, I, uh, my team gives me a hard time because I bring this up in, in like every discussion, but it's our mission is, is to increase the quality of life for yeah. the largest number of people we can in the most measurable way we can. And that's, you know, it's, it's tough with pain, but mm -hmm. when you can say all cause mortality goes down when you're using this kind of treatment and mm -hmm. all cause mortality when it goes down, double that when you use this mm -hmm. kind of treatment plus some kind of uh, rehab or recovery for, uh, again, you, I think you nailed it, the, the hips, uh, mm -hmm. when you start mm -hmm. seeing you, you have a few things that impact uh, older folks for their their balance. Mm -hmm. um, one is is your inner ear uh, starts drying out. You have right. this kind of balance point there that, yeah. that starts drying out, so you you can't balance quite as well. Your vision starts uh, uh, being impaired as well, so you can't see mm -hmm. to kind of correct course correct for this as much, and you start losing kind of your lower body strength and uh, with sarcopenia and muscle wasting. Yeah, I want everybody right now, if you're watching the video, tune in with me here. This is like, if you can do this test right here, right now, you're good. You need to just, yeah, yeah. that's, that's Peter Tia talks about it, looking at leg strength, looking at bone density. Um, Dr. Kelly Starrett uh, yes. in his latest work talking about longevity as well. That's one of the most basic, simple tests we can do as a humans to see, am I going to have to suffer with everything that you just talked about yeah. or not? It makes sense. There's also some good interventions that are that are coming to light right now. I, I think uh, eccentric training with things mm -hmm. like um, mm -hmm. the the flywheel training. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different companies out there. Vitruvian uh, out of Australia does mm -hmm. a really cool product. That's uh, if you think of uh, have you seen the Arcs Fitness uh, devices? No, no. They're they're really nice. They're AI driven um, kind of variable load uh, lifting or, or okay. kind of resistance training devices, but they're seventy thousand uh, dollars. So it's uh, it's hard that's a little to find bit more than uh, this at home light therapy device. I yes. got. Yes. <laughs> Damn. You know, but, but but speaking of, you know, I've got this here on the video for you guys. You want to check it out? This is the the Move Plus. Yes. This device I have been I've kept it in my backpack in my travels. It stays out with me every morning. Uh, this is something I've been using predominantly for, I mean, they'll correct me if I'm wrong. Will this work through clothing here? I, I'm wearing long sleeves, but um, ideally you want to kind of have on skin contact, right. right? Okay. You, you can do it through clothing if it's, if it's unavailable or it's too cold out or whatever otherwise. But uh, yeah, if you can get it uh, on the skin, it's it's ideal. So I'm using it here. You guys, again, check the video and it's just super easy. You adjust it. You put it on over a joint, over a muscle. I had several months ago um, a dumb deadlift injury where I was training outside and I wanted to finish the set and it started raining. Oof. And so my grip, my, my, grip, my grip slipped coming up. And so I kind of struggled to keep the grip and therefore all of that load, I, it was, I, I think it was like 400, four or five, what's four plates? I'm drawing a blank right now, yeah, 410? Yeah, yeah. Four or five, excuse four or five, me. That's right, yeah. Um, and so all that kind of fell on my, my forearm and I heard and felt this rip, this tear. Sure. And I was like, oh man, I, I think I just tore my bicep. And, but it turns out it was actually, it was partial bicep tendon and forearm tendon. And since then using this, just manage those kind of just nagging, like, ah, like aches and pains and kind of right. stiffness has been a game changer. I've had well, injuries right. before where I'm like, uh, it's going to hurt for a lot longer. Um, this I've been able to jump back in way quicker. I haven't gotten back to the deadlift game yet. Um, just, I don't know, maybe it's more of a mental thing, but just the difference that I feel and kind of that chronic, like little aches and pains, but then also knowing all the things that I know now from what you just shared with us, but my own personal research and stimulating blood for blood, blood flow. There we go. Excuse me. And stimulating mitochondrial yes. uh, health and stimulating nitric oxide and just reducing inflammation. Like I know it's also helping in a myriad of other ways in what, five to 15 minutes a day that's right yeah that's exactly it uh, by the way if you if you want a um uh kind of uh, input on different protocols that you can use to kind of rehab back into it uh sam dancer uh we were just with him uh amazing human being guys uh fittest man on earth uh oh wow just oh okay an absolute Cro Cro crossfit games right, Is that yes. right? okay yes uh absolute animal of a a uh an athlete but also just a really really good human being mm. uh tore his bicep uh, uses these devices to to kind of recover and rehab and come back into it and swears by it now he's he's traveling yeah. with it everywhere but he has a great protocol for it and he uh, he does he does a uh, an interesting um, uh, kind of clean 
he, he's uh, he's just like again a, a ridiculously strong human being. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So most of us couldn't get over 300 pounds with a with a regular clean. He can kind of do it with a, a dinosaur claw pull one, like where he's he's actually kind of he's he's oh. half curling it. Uh, oh, yeah. He, he throws on his T Rex arms. Yeah, he's he like, the T Rex arms in, and he's under it. But like you know, 300 plus pounds wow. and that type of thing is is pretty impressive. Wow. But he's he's uh, yeah he he had a great great experience with it. Um, you know, he's got a. a uh, $30,000 device at his house that just sits and uh, collects dust right now because he can take this and use it uh, more effectively. And this, use. you're saying he has replaced with a $30,000 recovery device? Uh, he replaces $30,000 Re recovery device with this. With this, yeah, okay, yeah. wow. So he, wow. Can, he can travel and and, uh, and use it more effectively. And he's just been a, a great kind of spokesperson for us about it because he's he's seen really good results for it. And I, yeah. I think this is one of the things where, especially when you're recovering from traumatic tissue damage like that, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a really... Uh, meaningful outcome that you can see for it in the short term, which mm -hmm. keeps you into the maintenance mm -hmm. of the program uh, for the long term. So I mentioned I was using this for an injury recovery. Now it's just kind of part of my regular recovery routine. What are the benefits that someone could find from a device like this, photobiomodulation, red light therapy? Let's say maybe they don't have an injury, but anyone listening to my show here is an active person in some capacity. They're not going to the CrossFit games. Maybe some of them are, but we're just trying to take care of our bodies. Yeah. But look, as we do that, we're more susceptible to injury, more susceptible to inflammation, especially as we get older. Like what are just kind of the general applications and benefits of something like this? If people are training heavily and especially high intensity training, reducing the recovery time, reducing delayed onset muscle soreness, um, the mm -hmm. that creatinine kinase and, and uh, CRP reduction uh, just means that you can go back in and, it's not that um, one of the things that's been really interesting in this in this research around this space, and particularly the guys at Innox, um, Evan Pycon and his his team uh, from a physiology standpoint are just amazing. Mm. Um, but what you see is that uh, it's not necessarily a mental thing that you're like. Sometimes you're like, all right, I trained really hard today, and you get back into yeah. morning, you're like, oh, I just can't. Yeah, I can't. yeah. It's your physiology uh, that's that's impaired, and this reduces that impairment on your physiology and means you can just get back in and get mm. after it harder. So you mentioned earlier, and I, I think this is one of the things that we really see as a, a kind of core concept for the benefits for this is percent differences. If mm -hmm. it's a single digit mm -hmm. percent every day, that's still meaningful. Let that add up over a couple of years and see how the differences are. How many of us, again, for just kind of the general active person, which I would kind of say where I'm at now in my life, how often does that just small percentage of oh, I'm so sore or like oh, I'm af maybe afraid of a flare up of an old injury, yeah. keep us from making the choice that we maybe want to make. And that's going to the yoga studio, going to the gym, or hell, even just taking a walk. Again, as we age and as we bang ourselves up more, it's that mental block okay. of, I don't want this to happen again, or I don't want to be sore from my flight, or I don't want to be, you know, stuck in doms, you know, yes. out the wazoo and not be able to pick up my kid kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, more of the life influence matters in our decision-making process now to train and be able to have better recovery, I think, than ever. Yes, no, I 100% agree, and I, I think that's exactly it. I, I you know, personally, uh, my use case for it is, um, if I have anything where it's kind of middleweight, uh, high reps, hmm. uh, high volume. So if we do, you know, uh, like over what, over 10 reps. So I, I'm thinking kind of like if we're if I'm doing 200 front rack lunges or something like okay, this, okay. I know my my quads and my uh, glutes are going to be sore. And, and not in a nice way. Like that's, that's, yeah, enough, that's yeah, one of those ones yeah. we can fight through it, but it's gonna it's gonna hurt tomorrow. <laughs> this this meaningfully and substantially and noticeably decreases that uh, muscle soreness, mm. and also just gets you back into like I could go, I probably wouldn't go back in and do that same heavy volume sure. version, but I might go row the next day mm -hmm. where I I, uh, I wouldn't put in as aggressive rowing program or something like this mm. the day after I did that. Uh, now I can, and so huh. it just lets you kind of steer your your programming in a more aggressive way uh, if you like to. Um, mm. The other things I use it for are, I've got an old uh, torn MCL, uh, mm -hmm. torn meniscus, just to kind of give an idea of, of different things uh, that will flare up from box jumps or, or from uh, rope jumping or something like this occasionally. And that used to take me, you know, a couple of weeks to get back in mm -hmm. full 100%, and now it's two or three days. Um, mm -hmm. I use it daily on my gut. Uh, I've just noticed a better kind of more positive outlook. You just open it up and lay it across? That's right. Pull oh, them wow. as tight as you can together and then just kind of clip them there. Interesting. We actually have an, uh, an extension hmm. uh, um uh, kind of strap for it right now that I can send you. What do you notice from the, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. What do you notice from the gut health application? Just feel better. I, mm. I just feel more that it, it's, um, I haven't tested myself for this, but from the medical literature, it should be increasing dopamine. Um, and, uh, decreasing, which is the vast majority is created in the gut. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and decreasing inflammation mm. there. And so I, I just, I feel better on a daily basis and I, I have kind of, 
uh, just a kind of generally, mm -hmm. you know, more positive outlook on things, um, which is, is always a plus. Yes, which is great, especially if, you know, you're building a new business. Entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. is, is a uh, mm -hmm. high risk, high high reward space, but it's uh, it's a lot of stress mm -hmm. in general. You have to have some level of, of uh, management tools mm -hmm. in place. And this is one of them that I do. Being able to craft out the habits, the hacks, if you will, yes. the tools, the resources, product services, whatever that looks like for you, the person listening, watching. Being able to do that so that you can feel as good as possible in any and every situation, personally, that's what I'm after. Yes. You know, that's the whole kind of concept of living a life ever forward is being aware of these things that work for you so that you don't have to as much or as often compartmentalize these things that you know work. It's like, what can I do to build the most solid foundation, the most bulletproof foundation of making me and keeping me feeling good yes. so that I don't have to work as hard over time as I age <laughs> to get back yeah. to that feeling of that new, that same baseline, you know? Yeah, no, I love it. And, and it also provides you additional resilience. I, I think we both kind of travel a bit and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it does take it out of you if you're not, if you're not managing yourself. Yeah. But it's nice to come back into a space where you have those habits, where yeah. you have that kind of baseline that you feel comfortable in and that you can kind of build robustness and resilience into your into your physiology. I do have um, I do have another question around this app, unique application. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to use for my example here? You know, I am still kind of working around again, more of a mental block working around this bicep and forearm mm -hmm. injury. Would wearing this during a training session where maybe I am pulling, focusing on grip strength or even, you know, engaging bicep, would wearing it during give me any extra edge compared to after in my recovery? So there has been uh, some performance benefit that has been uh, cataloged in, in different medical studies, uh, but typically they don't, th nobody's really had it to wear <laughs> until these, until these kind of devices right now, nobody's yeah. had it to wear. So it hasn't been tested during but uh, ahead of time, so if you say five minutes ahead of time, uh, they have uh, tested. So before a training session. That's right. Wow, wow. Okay. Um, and, and really that comes back to they're, they're doing primarily cardiovascular uh, oh, wow. training that they've, they've tested this with and seeing. It's like an internal warm-up. Yes, that's right. That's right. Wow, so you, you wow. see rowers have a, a uh, they do essentially ramp tests or, or mm -hmm. um, critical power tests mm -hmm. type, type thing, mm -hmm. and they see better outcomes for, from wow. a performance standpoint. All right, well, uh, after we're done here, I'm going to train. So I'm wondering yeah, <laughs> if get it this on. is going to be, out. Yeah. I'm really curious now. I've yeah. thought about that. Um, well, this has been incredible for us. I, I'm so fascinated by where we're at in the world now, and especially what you guys are doing at Kenyon uh, for just bringing, bringing the science and the clinical evidence and clinical applications to the world, but being able to translate that and show us, hey, here, here's real world application. Here's what we see in the science, but we know this is really what your life looks like and what you need and what you want. And just where we are in terms of access information and lower barrier to entry in terms of cost as well. I mean, for what something like this does and what we would need, even just a few years ago, see sessions over. Um, I mean, you've already shared, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars and yeah. usually only accessible to high performers, athletes, or people with much larger budgets than me. Um, but this device, like I said, is so easy and convenient and I found a lot of value out of it. I still do. It's been everywhere with me now. That's awesome. So thank I you love guys. To hear that. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, and like, like I kind of already said, you know, this kind of helps us paint the picture of being able to feel happy, feel good and keep, building and maintain the life that we want um, and just everyday living, living an active life so that we can move forward in life. How does something like this, how do you, how does your mission help us move ever forward? What does that mean to you? To me, it's that same thing we talked about earlier is, is make those percent changes each day. Um, and, and for us as a team, it really comes back to our core mission, which is improving quality of life mm. in, a, in a measurable way. And um, we're, we're taking steps in that way from a technology standpoint with our new sensor package we're putting together that's that's measuring hemodynamics and metabolic dynamics in the body and that will provide us a feedback loop oh, don't tell me that i don't need to nerd out anymore <laughs> <laughs> i got too many things i'm trying to trying to look up and study but bring it on anyway yeah. <laughs> the main thing is we we have the ability now and and uh, i think again it's, it's one of the things that's so exciting to be in the space that we're in right now uh to really challenge what's been available from a data standpoint relative to how we measure ourselves and then how do we build in how do we justify how do we kind of put feedback loops on these different processes mm -hmm. that we're using so that not only do we start with these kind of 80 20 Pareto mm -hmm. principle uh high leverage approaches uh but then even within those steer them in a way that that makes it mm -hmm. even more high leverage and I, again 
that comes back to where we're we're building out our uh, spectroscopy systems um, over the next couple of years. And, and uh, just finished, I, I mentioned before we uh, jumped on a, a couple of uh, Department of Defense grant uh, mm. applications. I, I think we have a very good shot at winning um, wow, with wow. these kind of new ways of measuring a lot of, I think you've nailed it with inflammation. Mm -hmm. One way of, of um, kind of the, the other side of the coin for inflammation is metabolic health. And I, I think um, when- We've seen when, a lot of that. That was an, uh, yeah. another thing I think this year has been very trendy and an important yes. way is metabolic health. And I had some amazing guests to kind of cover that as well. But again, it's the thing is never the thing. We talk about metabolic health because yes. of its reduction in inflammation. Yes, yes, that's it. That's it. And, and there are there are benefits to the metabolic side as well. But I think mm -hmm. you know, one of the things we're seeing right now is you know things like continuous glucose monitors mm -hmm. and and um, again kind of uh, whoop straps where you're using PPG sensors. Mm -hmm. These these is an example, and they've done a great job with it. I, I uh, I'm not bagging anybody else's product, but it's it's uh, they're they're using a PPG type uh, technology that's that's you know been in pulse ox type uh, situations in, in a hospital for you know decades. PPG is what for us. Uh, plethysmography uh, is the the short version of that. Oh um, wow, okay. But basically, shine, it's, it's got like a light, that you're talking about the light sensor yes. in the back, right? Okay. So it's got it's got uh, a number of different. The these are micro here. LEDs yeah. and then uh, photodiodes. Okay. Um, so what's what's happened over the last uh, five to ten years though is that at, uh, you're not really so LEDs were great. So, mm -hmm. uh, solid state solid state emitters are a, a really good thing to be able to build into a, a system versus to having to mm -hmm. use like halogen lamps. So you can only do it in the lab. What's happened recently, though, is that you're also looking at things where laser uh, manufacturing has gotten much more inexpensive and mm -hmm. uh, has been adopted more broadly for cell phones, a number of different things. So lasers are a, a, a better emitter if you want to, for example, shoot something for, for measuring internal Right, tissue, yeah. Uh, I was like, seeing like a lot brain. of this in the research um, on, on understanding red light therapy and photobiomodulation was really like laser seemed to kind of be more the golden standard yes. and was what they used to study, but it was also so expensive and just so unrealistic for anybody else in the real world to really have a access to. Yes. It, well, until, until now, really, yeah. I mean, really only in the last two, when we started designing our product, uh, which we started really kind of manufacturing and delivering what September, August, September of last year, when we started designing it, the, the lasers that were available were 20 times more expensive than the ones we're using right now. Oof. But you have, um, you know, there's a couple of different things. When mobile phones and LiDAR systems for autonomous cars start adopting this type of technology, it starts getting micronized. The volume of it starts increasing mm -hmm. and the price goes mm -hmm. down. So you have that kind of um, inverse effect. Yeah. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing with a couple of new versions of, of uh, lasers now. The, the, uh, the vertical cavity surface emission lasers that we're using for our devices for therapeutic side, mm -hmm. we'll also be able to leverage those and, and one other type of laser for... Um, a, a spectroscopy system where you shoot the laser in and then you measure it back out with wow, these photodiodes. Wow. But the photodiodes are also being upgraded. So you have you have these um, silicon photomultipliers, which are kind of too expensive Damn. for us to, to kind of launch right now with our spectroscopy system. But in three or four years, mm -hmm. the, the, they're dropping off a cliff because they're being picked up by larger volume industries. So what that allows us to do is have the hardware to be able to build much higher resolution, much better signal mm -hmm. uh, brain measurements. And so... Uh, if you can kind of think about um, like how an fMRI works, mm -hmm. uh, you, you get to see the inner workings of the brain and what's happening there in real time. With, in, in real mm -hmm. time, but it's a humongous two mm -hmm. million dollar tube. Mm -hmm. um, what, what we're doing with spectroscopy just is is going to use near infrared to be able to make that something that people Ooh. can wear. Wow! Um, and having a three D map of how you're so what people have used in the space in the in in the labs previous to now has been uh, hemodynamics. So how does how does hemoglobin, um, how is hemoglobin a proxy for uh, energy uh, mm. usage in your brain? And, and you, can, you can pull together a mathematical case around that, um, but it's not great resolution. Mm. Um, and what we really like to see is something where you're looking at a combination of hemodynamics and then mitochondrial function. Mm. Uh, and so uh, in the mitochondria, one of the things that we interact with, so hemoglobin um, is a, a competitive nitric oxide and, and uh, oxygen binding molecule uh, there's and it has a heme core which is something that that actually we know how it interacts with infrared light oh interesting when you do the same thing there's a there's a uh, enzyme in the uh, phospholipid bilayer the electron uh, transport chain of your mitochondria called uh, cytochrome c oxidase that has a very similar reaction but there's just less of it in the okay. uh, in the body there's hemoglobin everywhere cytochrome c oxidase is just kind of less volume of it and so you have to have a much higher resolution uh, 
scan or, or spectroscopy take for being able, able to, to read that. that up, yeah. We're just now getting to the point where we can kind of start measuring that metabolic Amazing. functionality and then mapping it over with this uh, oh, dynamic huge. functionality. That's huge. But it's, it's crazy because you you a lot of the things that you see from a behavioral standpoint come back to this metabolic piece um, where, where inflammation, again, is the backside of this mm -hmm. coin, but um, different types of dementia, yep. uh, Alzheimer's, Lewy body syndrome, uh, major depressive disorder, bipolar, um, chronic anxiety, all of these have different maps Unreal. of yeah. like how we can see that in the brain. So uh, long story short, yeah, it's, it's, I get a little bit uh, overly no, it's, excited it's about it. No, it's very important <laughs> and very exciting, and I'll give everybody uh, some other great resources to check out on this stuff. Uh, to your point around mitochondrial health, um, I'll link in the show notes for everybody. Go back and check, I forget the episode number, with Chris Wrench, uh, founder of uh, Amazentis creates this amazing product called Timeline Nutrition, MitoPure, uh, and also oh, yeah, for a masterclass yeah. on metabolic health and brain health, even mm -hmm. mental health uh, and chronic inflammation disease. Check out the episode with Dr. Chris Palmer around the brain energy theory. Amazing book as well, Brain Energy, if you haven't checked it out. It's just, he makes this very bold claim and backs it up with a lot of amazing science about how mental health, really mental illness is really metabolic disease. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. The, the data really, wrong. really yeah. supports that. And I, I think... There are some some things uh, to still be done from a a, uh, a research and, mm -hmm. and kind of medical trial standpoint to, to really prove that out fully. But you know we're we're we we have a high confidence level in that. There's you're starting to see yeah. that more and more. And particularly as you get these better pictures that you can you can do with right, the increasing right. levels of, of uh, specificity that you can see in this. So well, as all this tech grows and evolves, um, I definitely can't wait to have to have you back on the show sometime or just you know, even dive deeper on this stuff. Again, Kenyon, the Move Plus has been an amazing asset to my just general wellness, but especially recovery. Uh, so you guys definitely got to check out Kenyon and what they're up to and the new devices coming out, the new applications. It's just uh, access and cost and ease is really, really meeting us, meeting the consumers in a big, big way now. Um, and definitely helps us move forward quite literally. So <laughs> Forrest, I say thank you, man. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Really Beautiful. appreciate it.